Hello, everyone. Welcome. So we'll just give a few minutes here for everyone to get into the meeting. Thank you for being here today. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Vaughn here. Hi, Dr. Hi. Vaughn. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. You're yeah. most welcome. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> Al Newfeld here. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Can you do a meeting with somebody? <laughs> <laughs> the joys of help. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like someone's got a helper. Mm -hmm. We're just waiting for everyone. Hi. Really looking forward to this presentation, Shelly. Hi, who am I speaking to? Catherine Ryan. I'm a nurse practitioner in long-term care. Hi, Catherine. What's, what site are you working at? Uh, Glenbury Hospital and James Bay Care Center. Wonderful. Yeah, it is wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's been great. Hi, Shelly. It's Dr. Jovic. I don't know if you can see me. But. Hello, Dr. Jovic. No, I don't see you, but hello. And uh, thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. I don't know where the video is. Yeah, unfortunately, with the webinar, it doesn't let us have video oh, as well. Fine. That's yeah. fine. Yes. Hi, Shelley. I'm Samantha. I'm a LPN uh, in long term care. What site do you work at, Samantha? I'm at Malaspina Care Residence in Nanaimo. Lovely. Welcome. Thanks. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Shelley. It's Fung Pham. I'm working at Long Term Care Sunset Lodge. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I don't know if uh, you hear me. I'm Aurora. Okay, I can hear you. Hi, Aurora. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm uh, working at Hollywood Manor Long Term Care uh, in Maple Ridge. What's your role? Uh, LPN. LPN, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a couple more minutes here while more people are joining us. We'll get started here pretty quick. Thanks, Dr. Alhada, hello. Hi, Christelle. Hi, Shelley, Dr. Nuadek here. Hi. Hi, it's Dr. McPherson, palliative physician normally in Maple Ridge, currently locoping and low coming up in Whitehorse. Nicola. Wow, welcome. How's the weather up there? <laughs> uh, they're about to heat, hit a heat wave for Thursday, uh, sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Wow. Be in the 30s. Yikes. Stay cool, stay safe. Oh. <laughs> Right. Like <laughs> if everyone just can just keep themselves muted if they're not talking that would be wonderful thank you hi shelly it's maria lpn hi maria where are you joining us from from um Kiwanis pavilion long-term care dementia lovely thank you hi shelly hi who's this this is rubilin tadwell Hi. Uh, Beacon Hill Villa, long-term care. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Al Newfeld. I'm a semi-retired GP in Maple Ridge, doing locums. Hi, sorry, I didn't catch the name. Al Newfeld. Oh, Al Newfeld, hi, yes. Hello, my name is Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, uh, I'm from Maple Ridge and I'm RCC at Bailey House. Lovely, thank you. So, hi, my name is Miriam. Hi, Miriam. I'm doing community right now, and we also have like a palliative uh, clients. What office do you work at? A Victoria Health Unit. Oh, lovely. Nice to have some community partners here this evening. Thank you. Hi, Shelley. It's Angela. I'm from Victoria, and I work at Mount St. Mary Hospital which is long-term care. Yes, hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. hi, 
Hi, Shelly. This is Asha Maya. I am an LPN currently working at Sunnish Peninsula Hospital Long Term Care. Hello, Asha. I think you and I know one another. Thank you. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I'm Jessica. I'm the LTCI Operations Lead for Victoria South Island. Um, I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to our virtual long-term care learning series on wounds. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging with great respect and appreciation that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Sauk Nation. I feel privileged and thankful every day to work and live in this beautiful location. Um, so just to start with a couple of housekeeping items, please keep yourself muted. Background noise can amplify very quickly in this kind of event. Um, there are CME credits available. A member of the LTCI team will email you a certificate within a few days of the event. Um, so at the end of the evening, we will have an evaluation. Please take a moment to complete this. Your feedback is very important to us. Um, yes, and so uh, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat and raising your hand button. There will be an opportunity for engagement throughout the event as well as a Q&A at the end. So if you do have a time sensitive question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, any questions that are in the chat box, we will answer in the end so at the Q&A section. Um, so finally, I'd like to introduce our presenter for this evening. We have Shelley Barnes, a clinical nurse educator. So born and raised in the Muskokas, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Shelley moved to Victoria in 2000 and started her career in the burn unit on Royal 2. Shelley stayed on Royal 2 for 15 years where she encountered lots of plastics, wound care and surgical experience. Uh, Shelley then shifted to a community clinic where she stayed for four years. Currently, you can find Shelley working in the burn outpatient clinic, lower leg wound clinic, as well as care management for the HSCL community. Shelley is just about to finish the NSWOC program. We are very grateful for Shelley who has come and stepped in sort of last moment. We did have a, another presenter previously who had to pull out um, due to unforeseen circumstances. So we're very thankful for Shelley to coming in fairly last moment. Um, so thank you. Without further ado, over to Shelley. Hi, thanks, Jessica. Good evening, all. And uh, Jessica has been working really hard behind the scenes to help me pull this together. So a big thank you to you, Jessica, and Alana, who's working in the background as well. So let's jump right into the session on wounds in long-term care. Next slide. And I have no conflicts of interest to declare this evening. Next slide. There's a lot to talk about regarding wounds. So I thought we'd cover some basics with a focus on pressure injuries. So if you have questions, do jump in and ask, or you can save them until the end. Uh, they might get answered as we move along. And for those of you who might be a bit shy, I'm happy to chat one-on-one -on -one later if you like. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, did we miss the poll question? Ah, give everybody a minute to think about this one. Nobody will know what answer you're choosing, so um, just click and submit. Excellent. I think most people have chosen false on this first question, and you are correct. Wounds that are closed are not completely healed. And let's talk about that. Next slide. Just a little review about how wounds do heal. Four stages of healing that should follow this timeline and this order. Where we get into concern are those hard to heal or those chronic wounds that get stuck in the inflammatory period. And that's usually due to wound debris like slough and biofilm and infection. Moisture balance and edema will also play a big role in stalled wound healing. And as you can see here, wounds can take up to two years to be completely healed. And even then the area will only achieve about 80% of its tensile strength that it had before the wound. And that's because the scar tissue is less reactive and resilient compared to our skin. And if we just click on the slide, we've got some photos here. 
can see the progression of wound healing there. Excellent. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. This will be poll number two. Poll number two, yes. Again, no one will know which answer is yours, so choose your response and click submit. You see a comment there where some people can't see the poll. So the question is the practitioner is obtaining a wound culture using the swab technique. The practitioner should, and then there are several options there. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, interesting. We've got some. Some indecisiveness about that. Okay, here's your answer. Uh, there is a policy and procedure about collecting wound swabs. You do need a wide enough area, that one centimeter squared, um, clear area to get wound fluid from. So sometimes you'll be asked to collect a wound swab from, from deep into a tiny little area. And unless you've got a good centimeter of, of space and not covered with slop, a, a nice healthy wound bed, um, you're gonna get inconsistent results. There is policy and procedure on that. <laughs> Next slide. Barriers to wound healing. When you have a wound that isn't progressing, there are some questions that you should be asking about. Um, bio burden includes active infection, debris, slough, eschar, and biofilm. Repeated trauma will keep resetting that healing cascade and you're not gonna make any progress. Smoking, vasoconstriction from one cigarette can last up to an hour. You might wanna share that with, with some of your folks. <laughs> skin condition also bears no cure. Periwound skin that's too wet or too dry can't support epithelialization. So moisture management beyond the wound bed is important. And I do wanna make a little nutrition note here. We generally need about 0.8 grams of protein per kilo per day. And wounds can increase those needs almost double. So for anybody with a wound or potential for pressure injury should be seen by dietitian. Uh, they'll help with your protein, calorie needs, vitamin supports for healing. Uh, there's also a mini nutritional assessment that is designed for use in older clients and combined screening with assessment. Next slide. I think this is the most important slide that we're going to see this evening. <laughs> Antimicrobial stewardship is always a priority and we don't wanna be systemically treating infection that could be managed with topicals. So hopefully nerds and stones is familiar to, to some of you. Critical colonization can be managed with topical uh, products. And the indicators are there on the slide. Infection of course does need antibiotics as indicated from your wound swab sensitivities and a peri-wound erythema of about two centimeters or more is a good rule of thumb for infection if you're looking at that, uh, the redness. And reporting of pain is clinically significant for clients who have neuropathy. I'd also like to point out that the indicators for infection include things like changes in size and new areas of breakdown. You won't know this if you haven't done a good initial wound assessment and measurement and continuing to document if you knew, so that you know if the wound is getting larger or not. Next slide. Biofilm. Biofilms are a matrix in which bacteria are present they're resistant to our natural host immune responses and up to about five times more resistant to antibiotics and topical treatments. So Pseudomonas and Staph A are the usual culprits in biofilms and they need to be debrided for wounds to be able to progress in that healing cascade. Next slide. 
So let's take a look at wound care depending on the type of wound that you have. Next slide. The International Skin Tear Advisory Panel, some of you will be familiar with that acronym as well, defines a skin tear as a traumatic wound caused by mechanical force, which will include the removal of adhesives. Um, moisturize, that is a big part of preventing uh, skin tears. Choose dressings that are more gentle on aging skin, like the ones with the silicone borders, or use skin prep with the MePore. You can't use skin prep, by the way, with the silicone borders, they're not compatible. Um, please avoid suturing skin tears. Scary, uh, the scary strips are just fine. <laughs> you can also use films like a Tegaderm um, after the bleeding is controlled. The Teg absorbs will allow for monitoring and they'll absorb a little bit of Exudate if you have it, and it'll still protect and maintain that moist wound healing. There's a nice little algorithm there to follow. Um, a little note about hematomas here. Be sure that a bruise isn't mistaken for a hematoma. Hematomas bulge up, bruises are flat. Hematomas can create significant wounds. Um, they can be viable if you evacuate them within a day or two. Otherwise, those top tissues will die and you get pressure exerted down into the wound bed and it creates a pressure ulcer and the wound gets bigger. And we've had a few of those come through Clinic 3 that have actually needed uh, grafting because the wound has gotten so big with the pressure of that hematoma. Next slide. Hole number three. This one's a bit tricky. Good, it looks like the majority of people chose the correct answer, which is the um, patient with diabetes and a dry, stable Eshkar. Um, you don't, if, if somebody's not healable and they've got a dry cap of, of Eshkar, please leave it. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Next slide. Next slide. Excellent, most people got that one too. The crusting and the itching are, are key for dermatitis. People will complain about the itch. And then when you look at the, the, the peri wound skin, it's the, the crusting is there and that's what's causing the irritation. Um, the cellulitis is a deeper tissue infection and it will present that way. We get that question a lot. Next slide. So we've all seen lots of these types of wounds. Uh, venous ulcers are all about dysfunctional valves and, and edema. And any gait alteration that affects that calf pump will impact your lower leg circulation. So the area is often edematous and drainage is going to be an issue. So these venous ulcers won't heal without edema control and you need to elevate. Those are the two key, key points for venous ulcers. Um, your resident might report heaviness or aching or swelling. And, and again, that itch with these wounds, um, it's common. 
for venous ulcers to get a dermatitis um, related inflammation. Um, it's usually related to the wound exudate on the surrounding skin and the multiple products that we put on that creates a contact sensitization that presents like an irritation and inflammation. Lanolin is, is something to stay away from for sure. Um, Long-term use of topical antibiotics like polysporin and fusidin. Um, they'll cross react these topicals and dressings and adhesives will also contribute to contact sensitization. So again, keep it simple. Next slide. Arterial wounds need confirmation of perfusion to determine their healability. So we need to know that they're healable and um, there's, you know, there's, there's testing that can be done in order for that. Venous ulcers need elevation and compression. So arterial, you need to know that you've got perfusion for the venous ulcers, elevate and compress. And sometimes wounds just aren't healable. And those are maintenance wounds. And then the focus will shift to preventing infection, protecting them from further trauma or from the wound from getting any worse. Um, it may be that later on things could change. So if you've got a resident that's able to stop smoking maybe, um, would change the goal back to a, a healable wound. And then comfort care is the most appropriate for palliative wounds. Um, symptom management, controlling pain and itch, exudate and odor and preventing bleeding. Next slide. Neuropathic wounds need offloading and tight glycemic control. The offloading is key. And foot care nurses, podiatry, um, debride the calluses down. It, you really need the offloading. That, that's the big part and manage their blood sugars. Always use an antimicrobial for these folks, whether or not there's an infection just to protect them. Next slide. Our fungating wounds need a palliative approach, as I mentioned, uh, manage the symptoms and have a plan for a big bleed if you anticipate that happening and no negative pressure for these wounds, no vac. Um, they're at high risk for bleed anyhow and we don't want to make things worse. Next slide. Pressure injuries usually occur over a bony prominence, which helps to differentiate these from say an incontinence associated dermatitis at the coccyx area. Um, we do have a pressure injury clinic at RJH now and the referral is online. Some of those team members are down at the bottom of that slide. Next slide. We're gonna practice staging some of these. What do you think this one is? Excellent, next slide. This is a stage one. <laughs> um, the erythema is gonna be non-blanchable, the skin is intact, and we know it's not a yeast infection because it doesn't have those um, little satellite lesions at the borders that you would see with a yeast infection. It's the non-blanchable intact skin are, are the keys here. Um, if that, erythema is a different color. We're looking at a different stage. Next slide. What about this one? Well done, yes, next slide. This is a stage two um, and it's a partial thickness injury. So the wound bed is gonna be pretty healthy. 
you shouldn't see any exposed tendons or bone or slough. Um, shearing and moisture are what cause these. Please be sure that you're not calling pressure ulcers, um, moisture associated skin damage or you know, skin damage from um, incontinence because they look different and we treat them differently. So keep those ones separate. Next slide. If the slides are going too quickly, folks, somebody just put a comment in or, or put your hand up. Uh, stage three. Full thickness injury. We can see there's some rolled edges around this wound. There's some slough. Um, there could be some undermining in this one as well. It'll be deeper in areas that don't have as much tissue. But again, no, no bone or muscle or anything visible in these ones. Next slide. What do you think this one is? Mm -hmm. Yep, this one's a stage four for sure. Next slide. Stage four injuries are full thickness with tissue loss. So that's what we're seeing in this photo. Um, so there will be exposed tendon, muscle, bone, or hardware as we see in this photo. So there's lots of stuff exposed in a stage four. Next slide. Unstable, unstageable injuries. Um, and these are unstageable because there's no way to know how deep they are without removing that slough and the eshkar that's covering the wound bed. But if you did, uh, it's probably a stage three or stage four. If it's a dry, stable eshkar, so you can't move it, it's stuck, it's dry and intact, please leave it alone if you don't think you can heal this wound. Next slide. What's this one? Suspected deep tissue injury for sure. Next slide. These injuries are deeper in color. So you'll see the difference between, um, if you think back to the first slide that had that, that um, even colored erythema, this one's got that deeper color. There's a little bit of maroon. It's, you know, looks like it's gonna slough away up towards the, the midfoot. These might resolve on their own if you can offload and maximize healing condition like protein. Next slide. Mm. Pressure injuries need pressure redistribution surfaces like those low air loss mattresses and positioning to offload their ulcers. Um, and then usual wound bed management. So what do we need to know and consider to optimize healing? Well, we need some background in etiology, um, blood work and diagnostics. We need to look at your resident compliance, their environment. For example, if your resident sharing accommodations with five other people, they may not be able to manage keeping their wound dressings or their wound coverings clean and dry. Cost is another consideration. And I would say here that a more expensive bandage does not necessarily increase the cost of wound care. So if you're using a contact layer and topper that can stay on for five days, maybe an Ergo Tool AG and a Mepilex mortar, sure they cost more, but compared to daily anodine and amipore, plus nursing time, 
plus repeated denuding of the peri wound skin, plus the residence time, scheduling everything in community, you know. Um, and then each time we open up a wound dressing, the wound bed gets exposed to that cool, dry air, and we lose anywhere from five to eight hours of healing. So if you think about losing, let's say, six hours with a dressing change, and you have a resident who smokes 10 cigarettes a day, um, now we're down to about eight hours of healing time. So if you can keep the bandage on, it's gonna help. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Thank you. So the best dressing is the one that works <laughs> and the one that your resident will tolerate. So there's no sense in putting an Una boot on someone if they're just gonna take it off in a few hours because they can't tolerate that compression. Um, keep it simple. Oh, we'll talk about that, Dr. Jovic. Um, yeah, so for the cleanup jobs down at the bottom of the slide, we've got a few phases. Um, the cleanup jobs, if you're using a sandal, you need a prescription for that. Um, and swaps can apply maggots, but they have to be ordered in. There's a lot of monitoring. There's a lot of fuss with maggots, although they do a fantastic job. And of course, sharp debridement is carried out by clinicians who have the knowledge and training to do that. Next slide. This isn't an exhaustive list of the products available within Island Health and um, all of them are on the CLIC website, CLWK. I'll, I'll give you a bit more information about that. Um, the CLIC website has a one page, here's what it does, how to use it and where not to use it kind of one page cheat sheet for all of our products. Um, and oftentimes I will print that page off and put it in with the care plan so that others can reference it too. Just a little note here, there's a few stars. Uh, we're not using Prontosan anymore as a, an antimicrobial. Uh, research wasn't able to support that claim, although you can use Prontosan uh, for biofilm because of the surfactant properties that are in that. Uh, it, it still works for biofilm. Anacept is a real favorite right now. It's basically a bleach solution. So it does need to be rinsed away from the wound bed and the surrounding skin before you put product on. And please make sure that you clean it before you put on a foam dressing. Uh, triad can be used as a standalone dressing for wet, hard to bandage areas that are not infected. So coccyx area, groins, um, if there's no infection there, triad's great. Jellonet dries out in 24 hours. So if you're going to use this product, uh, make sure that you can change the dressing daily, or otherwise it's going to adhere to the wound bed and we're going to lose some healing time when you take it off. Next slide. That's about it. <laughs> Here are some frequently used resources and referrals on the South Island and all of the referrals are available online. Uh, the vascular access clinic is on the next slide. If we can advance. Oh, sorry. No, it's a click website. Um, this, I use this website all the time. This has all of the products on it that we have in our formulary. Um, I won't tell you how to get there. <laughs> it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a thing, but once you've once you've figured your way through it, it's really really helpful. I would strongly suggest that you get familiar with this website, um, and you can search by product name or by category. So when you're in this website, if you want to know, um, for example, how long can I leave on Ergo Tool AG? I forget when I have to change this. You can type that name in, and it will bring up that one page cheat sheet. Or if you get a care plan that says apply non-elastic short stretch compression, you're thinking, oh, I don't remember what that is. You can type in compression and it will give you the drop down box of what that compression is. Next page. There it is. There's the vascular clinic referral. Um, sometimes there's some misunderstanding about accessing this clinic. You don't have to go through the lower leg clinic to access the vascular limb clinic. MRPs can refer directly um, and it might save you some time. I, it's, the lower leg is really busy and it may take a while to get your client in 
to see them and then, you know, the next week for the, the vascular clinic day. So um, go ahead and use the referral form and just go straight to the, um, the clinic booking and save yourself some time there. Next slide. Okay. Quick and easy. <laughs> but I'm expecting all kinds of questions. Does anybody have anything in the chat box or anything that they wanted to bring up? Sorry, I can't see the chat box, so feel free to unmute. No problem. Catherine Ryan has just raised her hand. Hi, uh, Shelley. I just wanted to go back to one of the slides, and we don't have to go there, but the slide on uh, the diabetic neuropathic wound, mm -hmm. you said you should always use an antimicrobial. Now, you're talking about a topical Agent? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, thank you for clarifying. Yes, because these take so long to heal, um, they, they're they going to be open for a long time, which leaves them open to risk of infection and biofilm. So if we can keep something on, um, inodine works really well. As a, you know, it's non-toxic, we can use it for a long period of time while we support that wound healing. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Thank you. I have a question about use of flamazine. I just we had a, a round a couple of weeks ago with the emergency department, and they asked us not to use flamazine on burns again. Now, so I just wondered. Obviously, obviously, there's a difference of opinion. I've always used it. We have changed practice a little bit uh, about using flamazine. The issue with the flamazine is that it needs to be changed twice daily. It dries out. Um, so oftentimes, I, I don't know about your burn care, where you're from, but down here, it can take a few days to get into the burn clinic. Meanwhile, that flamazine sits there and it dries out. And when you desiccate tissue that's been burned, you can actually accelerate the burn down deeper. So what we're using right now is the Ergo Tool AG and lots of it. And then um, depending on the depth of the wound, those more shallow wounds will be quite wet. So if you've got the ergo tool down first as a contact layer and then um, bandages over top that your, your client can, can remove when they get wet and put clean down to manage the moisture. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Hi. Shelley. It's uh, Dr. David Brooke here. Um, Dr. Brooke. I have a question more about prevention and mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, people in late failure and late life, um, rough and bumpy skin, um, lipodermal sclerosis, all sorts mm -hmm. of conditions. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, the use of Cerave products. For example, Cerave hydrating cleanser instead of soap, a microfiber instead of a cotton washcloth, because I think mm -hmm. we see a lot of micro trauma with the best of intentions of caregivers who are mm -hmm. doing uh, perineal care. Mm -hmm. And I have always wondered, you know, the skin we're looking after is so incredibly paper thin. And I wondered if you had some thoughts apropos of how to prevent these things in the first place. Excellent question and thank you. I would agree with you. Um, the, the blue face cloths that we have for use in long-term care and the towels, um, I think are quite rough on that dry, fragile skin. I would agree with that. Um, if you have an opportunity to use something softer, absolutely, if you've got that available. We have no rinse skin cleanser now. It comes in a spray bottle. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, that's a really nice choice because it's got a little bit of a, a moisturizer in it that stays on the skin afterwards. And then you don't have to go through a, a second step of um, traumatizing that skin by trying to rinse it off. It's lovely. Um, it can go on and stay on. Um, moisturizer. Moisturizer is great. We, it's a step that we often forget. And yet if the skin is moisturized, there's a lot less chance of trauma. Um, I really like a dimethicone on areas that you think are at great risk of shearing because the dimethicone leaves a little, a little bit of a slippery barrier on the skin. So it's not likely to, to catch um, on a surface as, as the skin's moving across. Is, does, has anybody used anything in particular that they really, really like? I know what we have on formulary, but 
Um, can anybody offer up stuff that uh, they're using with really good success? Cerave SA for rough and bumpy skin. The, mm -hmm. I find the ceramide acts like a chain mail in keeping the, in, the hydration in. And the mm -hmm. alpha hydroxy uh, rebalances the keratinized layer and also yeah. prevents micro trauma. And it's slippery as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. There are a lot of formulary products that we have here in Island Health, and they tend to be used. Um, interchangeably and you know as you say for the for the attractane that only goes on those you know those diabetic heels that are really thick and scaly and dry you certainly wouldn't put those on a, a fragile uh, groin or or peri area for sure um, I think we have a lot to do to learn and educate about the moisturizers and skin protectants that we have <laughs> haven't seen Uda boots. We still use them here. Um, clinic three, the lower leg and wound clinic will order them. And they, um, they'll they support that calf pump for folks that are moving around. I think what we really like about them is the zinc in, in the visco paste. The zinc is really quite soothing for folks that are, are having a flare up. Yeah, you're right. It's kind of old school. Uh, there's just another question in chat here saying stage two ulcer infested with live maggots. What's the best plan? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> um, try to rinse them out as best you can. Um, maggots will drown if your wound bed is really, really wet. So it's, it's almost impossible, especially if you have tunneling or undermining to get all of those little guys out. Um, so you know, what you could do is, is really saturate that wound bed well, give it a cover dressing that's going to hold that moisture for a bit to drown them. And then you can irrigate them out again. If you don't think you've got them all, send them in and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use a more of a pressure wash to make sure that they're all gone. Good question. And just a, just a quick follow-up question to that one. Is it within LPN scope to do so? To remove the maggots? Yeah, I, I believe that is. Oh, irrigate. If you can see the base of the wound, you can irrigate out. I'm guessing um, if this is the situation, there's it's probably a more complicated wound presentation. So, you know, do invite someone else to collaborate and make sure that there isn't something else happening or there isn't um, other little tunneling and sinuses. My experience when, when there's been maggots is that there are teeny tiny little areas that they've been able to burrow down into that we don't necessarily see right away. Um, and they only you know, kind of hide down there. So do collaborate with your team. Can you comment on the fallacy of tube feeds in advanced dementia to help wound healing? Oh my goodness. Um, oh my goodness. That seems to me counterintuitive. Um, I'll ask other people to weigh in here. It seems to me in an advanced dementia, tube feeding would be quite um, bothersome to your client. And are, do they have a healable wound? And oftentimes I think in later dementia, um, you have more going on that's going to interfere with wound healing than just nutrition. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any comments about, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, are, are we tube feeding no. in later stages of dementia now? No. No. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. I didn't think so. Not seen that, no. No, no. Absolutely, Any, not. Absolutely not. No, no. So, you know, looking at it from a client-centered care point of view, um, you know, what what is the goal? Um, you know, if we can if we can heal it easily enough, great, but um, let's not create any more trauma trying to heal a wound if we're end stage. Some of the best advice I got was from Nick, Dr. Nicola McPherson, 
um, who uh, in her little black book of clinical pearls of end of life care, it's, it's brilliant by the way, uh, recommended uh, years ago, I learned to use um, metronidazole um, as for smell. Mm -hmm. And it really has made it a lot easier for the people who are really doing the care on these unhealable, end of life, terrible, deep uh, wounds that w w simply will not heal. And the least we can do, I think, is work together to relieve the suffering, uh, not, not of the person who has them, because they're, they're often not painful, but, but the smell can be really quite overpowering for, for uh, the staff. Yes, yes, and that's an excellent point. Yeah, this, this spray, uh, the flagell spray does work very, very well. Um, some I have seen uh, staff put a topper of the charcoal dressings over top of that as well, um, because you're right, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite difficult to manage for people who are caring for those individuals. And sometimes for the individuals that have a, if they have a big fungating um, wound close to their face, um, they, they will notice the smell and it, you know, it puts them off food and um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dr. Brooks. Thank you for that. I've had another question come in through our question and answer box here. How is Santil used? Santil is, um, comes in a little tube. It's a gel. It, um, it basically dissolves eshkar, that hard eshkar and, and slough that's very difficult to get uh, up and out of the way. Sometimes we'll use that to soften things up to make it easier to debride it out. Um, there is a cheat sheet <laughs> in our, our clip website. You can look up Santal. Um, if it's a really, I'll just mention this, if it's a really hard cap, like really, really dry, thick, hard cap, you might have to score it a little bit so that the product can get down into that really hard cap to allow those enzymes to work and, and um, soften that up so that it kind of releases up from the wound bed and then we can debride it out. Yeah, good question. Somebody else had a question about um, five-day dressings. Sorry, I was had myself muted there. What was the name of the five-day dressing? Oh, uh, so there are a few dressings that can stay on for a while. If a meat pork could stay on for five days, if you have a wound that's stable, it's not too wet, it's not infected. Um, but I think what you're thinking of was the Mephilex border. So we have some foam dressings on formulary right now. Um, the foam center part will absorb a fair amount of moisture and keep that moisture balance for wound healing. They're really great. Um, the foam will also help disperse pressure. So if you've got an area that you need to offload, the foam dressings are a good choice. Um, they also come with a, a silicone border to them. And that silicone border is really nice on the skin. And you can actually pick it up, um, pick it up from the skin and have a look and then put it back down and it will adhere. You can do that a couple of times with those dressings, which you can't do with a, a regular glue adhesive. Once you pick it up, it's gone. Uh, but the foams are really, really nice that way. Yeah, I like the foam dressings a lot. They're more expensive, but I think they're worth it. Another question here, when venomous wounds have Ex I am so sorry, <laughs> exudate, uh, two to three times dressing change daily. Uh, should we be using silver each time? Hmm. That's a lot of exudate. Um, I, I, think, I think you need to look at why you have that much exudate. Um, sounds like you need more compression for sure to bring that, uh, that exudate down. Um, sometimes increased exudate is a sign of infection. So trying to figure out why you have that exudate. Sometimes you can leave that base layer down. So the Restore or the ErgoTool AG, you can leave in place and just replace your top layers. Sometimes that will work. Um, Silver is expensive if you are replacing it two or three times a day. 
um, you might want to switch to something else that's a little less expensive, like the iodine or iodazorb uh, with the toppers on top that you can keep pulling off, but you need to manage that exudate first. You, you'll never heal with all that, that fluid. Yeah. Good question. Sorry, I can't see what comes up in the chat box. I'll just say out loud, Megan has just shared the clwk.ca uh, website address for anybody that was interested mm -hmm. um, and uh, saving that to their to their bookmarks for, for later exploration. Mm -hmm. I have that on my, my bookmarks. I reference that regularly. Um, if, if you can't remember, um, you know, is it compatible with this other dressing? Um, you know, how often do I need to change it? What kind of, of um, bacteria does it work on? It's all there. They're great. They're great cheat sheets. Yeah, I would highly recommend using that website. It's, it's the quick and dirty, what you need to know. Uh, we have gone through our written questions. I've seen a couple of people raise their hands and lower them. So if you've been saving a question, now is the time. I can be here for a little while if those of you who have questions that um, don't necessarily want to talk about them with an audience, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a bit. Thank you, Megan. Shelly, it's Catherine Ryan. That was really amazing. Catherine. And this can be a little Thank bit of all this topic, but wow. I hope um, we'll have access to the presentation. There was a lot of good information there. Yes, yes. I believe the slides will be PDF'd and then we are recording. So that would be there. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah, we'll distribute those slides via email um, and they'll also be posted on our website. So we'll send out a link for that as well, as well as the recording that all will be available. Great, thank you. That kind of is a nice segue into the evaluation. Um, I really hope you get a chance to fill that out. Um, it's really, really helpful for, for me and for the other presenters to know what went well, what you really appreciated, what, what you weren't interested in or what wasn't helpful um, and how we can make it better. Because for me, at least, I will take that information uh, for my own learning and develop something better for next time so your evaluations can help make a better presentation in the future so please <laughs> be honest be, be kind but be honest <laughs> can i you ask a question sure i have a resident who have um ulcerate and uh, cancer a wound on his top of the head on the top of the head? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing that we can keep the dressing on. And so bad odor, it's very foul smelling. Mm -hmm. And he keep on picking at it. So it mm -hmm. was bleeding and bad odor. What do mm -hmm. you have? We using the iodine cleaning but uh, everything we try to put it on, it fell off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it falling off because the adhesive won't stay on the skin or yeah. it gets yes. wet or it's an awkward um, size? It gets right on top of the skull mm -hmm. and we put the inner in dressing on, mm -hmm. but the other um, bottle dressing on, Nothing dressing, it stick, it fell off, or he pulled off because itchy and he mm -hmm. wanted to scratch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what to do. Yeah, you know what? That's um. Sorry, your name again? Fung. Fung. That's very common with those fungating wounds, and uh, I think you heard um, Dr. Brooks talking about the spray flagell. That will help with that that itch that that person's experiencing and it also helps with the smell so if you can get whoever does the ordering for your client for your wound care to order some um some spray on flagell yeah that will help it's a it's an antibiotic that will help um 
help the smell and it will help the itch. So what what bandages have you tried for adhesives? We use put the Optifoam, but it won't stay. And no. we put um, white border dressing or roller tape. Mm -hmm. Have you tried the blue silicone kind tape? We don't have that at don't the facility. Yeah, no, no problem. Do you have access to a silicone border bandage of any sort? No. No. Okay. I can ask them to buy some, order mm. some, but. Yeah, and, and um, you might be able to get something just for this particular client. The other thing you could do is, do you have any netting, any burn net or uh, blue line? The blue line, it, he have a, yeah, he, he have a big hat, so it's really tight. So you need a yellow line. Yeah, the yellow line. Uh, we we haven't tried the yellow line, but he, he just have a hat to put it on. Good. Good. To, to, yeah, get the hat, but nothing dressing stay on. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough area for sure. Um, try some skin prep with your regular dressings. You can't use skin prep with silicone, but try the skin prep. Do you, do you know what I mean by skin prep? I know, I use that yeah. the skin prep around before I put the tape on. Yeah, did I you let it dry? I the hair around the edge quite a bit, so it's not really uh, sticking to the hair. Mm -hmm. The hair no might hair be interfering. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, I just saw a little note here from Megan. What was your what was your um, experience with the blue silicone tape, Megan? Um, we currently have a resident with a similar wound, a cancerous head wound. We were recommended to give this tape a try. Mm -hmm. and it seems to be extremely adhesive, and the most painful part of the dressing change for this resident is actually the removal of the tape. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that we've tried like soaking with normal saline. We've tried a little bit of an alcohol swab to attempt to loosen some of the adhesive, but it really, there's nothing that seems to be working well. I was just wondering if you had any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're, the answer to the first part of your question, Megan, is yes, you do need an order for an antibiotic, the flagell. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, with the blue tape, do you have any of that product called Remove? It comes in a single package, it's a wipe. If you've got skin prep, you might have something called Remove. Never seen any of the Remove, we do have the skin prep. Mm. Okay. okay, so the Remove will actually dissolve the glue that's in the adhesive um, and you can just kind of work it away underneath the, the tape to get it to lift off that might be helpful. Yeah, um, I'd stay away from the alcohol just because that will strip the oils and dry out the skin. And um, you know, you're already, it sounds like denuding those top layers anyhow. So that's gonna create more of an irritation, perhaps. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. What about the silicone border bandages? Uh, we had been using those at first, but after uh, wound care, specialist took a look, she suggested that we try to use silicone board, uh, just the Methylex pads without the border yeah. and then secure them with the kind tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tricky. Sometimes you just keep, you know, um, MacGyvering things together until you hit on the right, the right product for your client. And we're all different, you know, with our, our skin moisture levels and um, pain tolerance and, and what's happening. Yeah, good. Somebody had a comment about the remove. About Stomacare. Yeah, there's a comment there from Paula Miller who says remove is this, uh, the same thing that you would use for Stomacare. It works wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does a really great job. Um, if you can get that ordered, I would highly recommend that one. I use those products quite a bit. Looks yeah. like we have a Karen Hicks also who has her hand up there. Hi, Karen. 
Hello. Uh, we had the same thing with a gentleman who had a uh, fungating wound on the top of his head. And mm -hmm. the only thing that seemed to work for keeping a dressing in place was to uh, wrap cling bandage in a in a way that just kind of it went under his chin and then around the back of his head, um, kind of like a cap. And that worked the best. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You might, uh, I'm not sure, it seems to me back in the, the back of my mind, you can get, you might be able to get flagellin a powder. And um, if that will help maintain the, the moisture level, so you're not, you don't have such a wet wound, that's that what might we, help too. Yeah, that's what we used as well was the, the flagellin powder. powder. And yeah. that would help with odor as well. Um, he ended up having to have the, the growth removed and he passed away shortly after, unfortunately. So yeah, it uh, didn't work out so well for him. But uh, at the same time, the care of the wound while he had that growth on his head was very challenging. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah. It sounds like you did a good job, though. You came up with some creative solutions. That's fantastic. Good job. Thank you. You're welcome. I like your MacGyvering comment. I think. <laughs> Don't we do that a lot? Yeah, I'm not afraid to use five fluorouracil. <laughs> so, so no, in some of those cases with these terrible fungating lesions. The other comment I'd make, particularly the ones at the top of the head with old men, is you know if we're not wearing great floppy hats right now, God knows these are the kinds of fungating lesions that should motivate mm -hmm. us to be using them when we're younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Um, and, and I often have had folks in, in the clinic who come in for, uh, you know, they've had a melanoma removed and they've got a graft on their head and boy, they're really diligent with their hat afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dr. Brooks, you probably have a lot of, of um, experience with those kinds of of fungating wounds that are on the top of the head. Have you found anything that works really well to keep a bandage on? No, I think you're, I, I think the other, other attendees here have come up with some very innovative things. It's yeah. very frustrating as you have pointed out and uh, yeah. you know, finding that that's why I liked your MacGyver comment. I think we're, you know, we can all, I, I think we should have these sorts of uh, confabs, you know, annually yeah. to, to update ourselves because we're all learning here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually just um, a, a little while ago had someone who um, didn't need the foam center part of a Mepilex border. It was too wet. It was keeping a very, very fragile wound just a little bit too wet. So I wanted a pore, but they couldn't tolerate the adhesive of a pore. So I <laughs> MacGyvered. Um, I took the center part away from the Mepilex border dressing, and I replaced it with the center part of the me pore. So I had the center part of the me pore that was drier, and I used the outside of the silicone border bandage to make a window dressing. And it worked beautifully. I don't think we have that on formulary, but if somebody's looking to make a buck, <laughs> come, come up with something. It's Dr. McPherson here up in Whitehorse. Hi. 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 Um, one of the products that, uh, so I'm a palliative physician and we end up dealing with fungating wounds in really awkward spots. And there is a product that compounding pharmacists know about called, um, it's a polymer gel. And I've gone just blank now on the brand name, but it's a wonderful thing that is, it, you keep it in the fridge and it's liquid. You can add flagell, you can add methadone, you can add all kinds of things to it. Oh. And it comes out of the fridge, you spray it on the wound. And as mm -hmm. it comes up to body temperature, it gelatinizes. So it's kind of the reverse of jello. So you can spray it yeah. on an awkward to dress area. It will, it will, it doesn't harden, it becomes gelatinous. Mm -hmm. And then the patient can walk around and the, um, the gel holds your methadone, flagell, all those other things in place for uh, symptom management. So it's so, a very wonderful Wow. Product. So, so there's no, no topper layer. It's just the nope. gel. Nope. And you can spray it. Like I, I've had people with big parotid cancers, like a cavity where their yeah, parotid yeah. used to be. They spray it in there. Once it's set up, they can stand up and walk around and they don't need any bandage on top of it. 
Wow. Can you please share that with me? I'm just going to look up the name of it. And, and vets apparently use it all the time because an animal won't keep a dressing on, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So they fill cavities and wounds with this gel and antibiotic, and they just keep it in place with the, you know, exposing the bite wound or whatever to the right. antibiotic gel for a week. With people, they can gently kind of um, remove it with some saline and um, put a fresh, you know, apply it fresh every day. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that they leave it out and it's become gelatinous in the spray bottle. You put it back in the fridge and it liquefies again. Wow. So it's really neat. Oh, stuff. I would love a little more information about that. Me too. I would like to know the name of it, the spelling. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, collaboration. I love this. I'm looking <laughs> up my recipe card collection. So just <laughs> if Thank you me. wanted to share that with the LTCI, um, then we can send that out to all attendees. So that would like be a lot great. Of interest. Yeah. Does anyone use triad on a regular basis for wounds? Yeah. 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 This is Miriam. Sorry. Yeah. In the community, they uh, we always use triad. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only like a wound care product that's very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's great. You don't need a cover dressing. It can just stay on there. And it does a beautiful job with that most that moist wound healing platform that you need. Um, you know, if you've got somebody that's got, you know, open spots on their arm, and they don't, they won't tolerate a dressing for whatever reason. Um, there, it's great. Yeah. Triad. Yeah. Triad's a great product. I, I think we don't, we don't consider it often enough. Uh, but you know, there's, there's no top that's right, Crystal Lee, yeah. Um, coccyx, groins, back of the neck um, can be used on the side of the face, a little ear wound. It's, it's great, works really, really well. Yep. Do you think I should try the triad in the, in the scalp? Well, also wound? You, you can't use triad if you have an infection because triad is occlusive. So it'll seal over and it will, it will hold the bacteria in there and it's gonna make things worse. Um, so I wouldn't put triad there. Although if the skin around that ulcer is getting wet and macerated, that's a brilliant place for triad to dry things out. But we don't ever put triad on healthy intact skin. It's meant to, to um, absorb moisture and dry things out. So if you put it on intact skin, you'll actually create um, a, a problem there. So I don't know that I'd put it on the fungating wound, uh, but see if you can get some flagell. Okay. Yeah, see if you can get that. I'm curious to know if it works for you. Let okay. me know. <laughs> Let <Bye>. me know. <laughs> okay. I think Samantha had her hand raised there. If you wanted to go ahead, Samantha, and then we have a couple of questions in the chat we can read out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So it, with the triad, we, we usually quite often, uh, I work on a secure dementia unit. Um, we use it for wounds on the difficult to dress areas, mm -hmm. so the coccyx particularly. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've also used it in situations when we've had, uh, we had one resident who had severe responsive behaviours with lots of aggression. Um, we put dressings on a lot. She had lots of skin tears mm -hmm. that she sustained due to her behaviours. Mm -hmm. um, and we ended up having to utilise the, the triad as a dressing mm -hmm. because when we did put a, a dressing on the skin tears, the resident would rip the dressings off and cause more trauma to her skin. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't tolerate them. So we've used the triad for those situations as well. And how, and we, how is and the wound healing? Um, it was uh, challenging, but this lady ended up with skin tears all over her arms. Um, it was a very, you know, uh, difficult, challenging case to deal with. Um, unfortunately, you know, she, eventually she passed away, but it was very difficult providing the wound care with a resident who has so much physical and verbal aggression for the nursing team to, to manage to clean, you know, cleanse the wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's those challenges of uh, the dementia care, um, mm -hmm. extremely challenging for us at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, good for you to credit, you know, come up with something creative there. The triad can stay on if it's not a super wet wound, like a 
you know, like a, um, a partial thickness wound, triad can stay on for up to seven days and you just keep adding to the, the top layer as it gets, you know, rubbed off or, or cleaned away. So you don't have to go through that, that dressing change procedure and the removal of bandages. And um, yeah, it's a great product in certain situations. It, it works, works really, really well. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. I think we've got a question in the chat from Nazar. Um, says he, I had a patient with a melanoma skin ulcers. Uh, they were tiny, but involving the whole leg and they bled all the time. She was on palliative chemotherapy. They grow slowly, but we had a tough time with these wounds. What is your advice? Hmm. Uh, were, were the ulcers... Were the ulcers related to um, a, a chemo side effect? Was it a um, was it a renal patient? Or was it just progression of disease? Feel free to unmute yourself, Dr. Al Haddad. Can't hear. Can't hear. That sounds that sounds really challenging. And they were bleeding a lot. Uh, he's written in chat that they were part of the melanoma. Oh. Yikes. Um, that's a tough one. I would, if they're not infected, I would be tempted to try the triad. If they're not infected and they're not terribly wet but it sounds like if they're bleeding a lot, they would have been. Um, that's, oh, that's a challenge. I'd have to think long and hard on that one. Um, is Dr. Brooks still here? Yeah, I'm still here, but I'm- What do you think? Um, well, I was thinking superficial radiation for palliation. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So it's just a shot in the dark for pure palliative for, to stop bleeding and it may not work. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, my, my, my microphone was uh, not, uh, not <laughs> bad. I just Thank you. recognize that. Yeah, that lady was, she's having started with very small melanomas uh, on the leg and she was on the, the new uh, immunotherapy type. But that, mm. that melanoma grow over the six months and involved the whole leg. And then the whole leg is, is, is ulcer-like and we were not able to do dressing for it. And she's bleeding all the time. And uh, no, she don't have any other issues other than melanoma itself, which is, it, she, was, uh, she was palliative for that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we, could, we could we could not do anything, but from uh, perspective of the wound, also we were not able to do much because it's a, a very large involvement of the whole leg. Dear, was it bothersome for your patient? Uh, it, it is bleeding all the time, so she had to wrap the whole leg all the time, and uh, all the clothes is is, is having these bloody. Uh, uh, serous secretions on her clothes all the time. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if um, I wonder if you could get a non-adhesive product like Adaptic, um, or or even some you know just some petrolatum to put down um, to to prevent all of that weeping onto the uh, the bed clothes, yeah, and then yeah. just change the outer dressings. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Could, could help, definitely, yeah. Yeah, because I think you're right. If we just keep that, um, that skin layer protected and manage the outer bandages, that's, mm -hmm. that may be her best option, yeah. maybe. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge. Thank you for bringing that one up. I'm going to think about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank oh.
We have another question from chat. Andrea has asked, any suggestion for lichen sclerosis causing open wounds in the peri area, currently being treated with Ultravate and then Sudocreme with no real improvement? Wow, okay, so you've got the topicals that you need. Um, are, are the, um, do you have open areas in, in skin folds? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just listening. Just, I'm, I'm not super familiar with Zoom, so. That's okay, you're doing great. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yeah, she's got a, um, she's, it's long standing. We've thrown every cream possible at it. And mm -hmm. um, currently the treatment is the Ultravate, then the doctor's having us blow dry it and then applying the pseudo cream on top. And it's just getting, it's not getting better at all. In fact, I would venture to say it's worsening. Okay. And the open area, she's got one, you know, right in, um, uh, like in her buttocks crease, right next to her anus. And then she's got another one right, like at the tip of her um, labia. And it's just, it's horrible. She's at the point now where she doesn't even want to sit down. It's so painful. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. So the... The wounds that you have, are they at skin folds? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Moist areas too. Very moist. Yeah. Can you use yeah. triad? Um, we have used triad in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of triad as well. Mm -hmm. I use mm -hmm. it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but again, nothing seems to do anything. How do you feel about Vaseline? Oh, no. For, oh, jump in. Somebody had an oh no there. Sorry, that's me. No, I I've seen Vaseline do amazing things on on some you know pretty nasty skin. Yeah, yeah. I it, it's hard to know without seeing it. The yeah. other thing that comes to mind is interdry. I yeah. don't know if that's compatible with the product you're using. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. But IntraDry is lovely. Yeah, IntraDry is great if you have a team who knows how to use it and a resident that's not going to keep pulling it out. Oh. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like IntraDry, you have to have that two inches exposed to air and, you know, it can stay on for five days, but, you know, people take it out and throw it out and they move it around. Yeah. Expensive. They move it around. They put creams on and then put the IntraDry on and, you know, it's hard to get compliance with. Yeah. You know, we've got three, four carry or, you know, six carries a day. So three. it's an education piece. Yeah. There too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, what about a silver powder? Oh yeah. You know the silver powder we use on stomas? Mm -hmm. I wonder if that would help. Silver powder. Hmm. I never thought of that. Maybe. Yeah. We had a, a lady with issues like that and it was all moisture and it was like slits um, of open skin and uh, we used the silver powder and then used uh, the skin prep spray on top of that to mm -hmm. keep it in place. Mm -hmm. That worked really well. Excellent. Oh, thank you. I think that's a great, great uh, suggestion. Well done. Yeah, just like the crusting procedure we do with stomas. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Alana and Jessica, I'm depending on you to tell me what comes up in the chat box because I can't see it. I've got nothing in there at the moment. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself there and ask away or chat something into the chat. I have one more question. It's Andrea again. Um, Andrea. Back to the triad. We mm -hmm. um, currently have a woman who's got a stage three pressure injury on her buttocks and we've been putting triad on it. Um, and it's not, there's nothing happening there. It's, and she's, she's, I mean, she's very frail. Would that be something that you could perhaps consider as a non-healing? Like, you know, we're doing, you know, extra protein and offloading pressure and she's got a rojo cushion and she's a lot more mobile now than she was when she got the injury but it's just not going anywhere 
Mm -hmm. um, it, it could very well be. Um, if you've optimized everything you possibly can, um, it could be critically colonized. Mm. Um, so it, it might need, um, you know, a little, a little debriding and, and restarting that wound healing cascade again, mm -hmm. hard, hard to know. Cause if it's been there for a while, there's probably biofilm yeah. and until we get rid of that, it's not really going to help. How do you um, feel about Medi honey? Yeah. I like Medi honey. I do too. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I've seen a lot of research with Medi honey and biofilm. Okay. Um, if someone else has, please. Uh, let me know. I just haven't come across anything. Um, the Anicept works well to get through the biofilm, as does the Prontosen. Uh, but I think you need to get rid of that first. There's okay. probably a biofilm there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's worth a try. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Again. yeah. Sorry, something popped up in the chat box, but I didn't get a good look. Uh, Alexis has written in, what are some tips on deciding when a wound can be open to air? <laughs> if it's closed, it can be open to air. So when I say closed, if you've got um, if you've got epithelialization across the, the wound bed, um, if somebody's really pushing for open to air, and a lot of folks really like the idea of open to air, um, I might suggest that maybe they put a little uh, Vaseline or something or, or triad and a little occlusive over top just to protect it from any debris or bacteria getting in if it's just a small little area. And again, if you've, if you've been working on a wound and you've got it down to it's just about done, um, pop a little triad on it because the triad will protect it. It'll keep that moist wound healing uh, underneath so it can finish off and protect it from you know anything getting in there that you've worked so hard to close. Good question. You're welcome. Hey, Shelly, thank you so much for that really informative presentation. Um, my question is a little bit maybe unorthodox and I'm not sure if you'll even be able to answer it more just kind of for some pondering or reflection, but I'm an employed student nurse and in my last three years in school, I've seen a lot of um, nurses take wound swabs and then get a covering order for it um, mm -hmm. in cases where the physician maybe isn't available or it's late at night. And it kind of seems like this kind of, you know, underbelly where it's not really within our scope, but I, I feel like, you know, a lot of the times it's pretty obvious if a wound is infected. And so my question was, what are your thoughts on advocating for a clinical decision-making tool for nurses to take wound swabs it, like to protect our license um because obviously it's something that's you know happening and I invite any clinicians to kind of share their thoughts on this or if you know of anything that exists like that or anything in the works um just want to hear your thoughts on that mm -hmm. um do we still have any physicians online that want to weigh in here no Okay. Um, yeah, it would be really great if we could have a, a clinical order set for wound swabs or urinalysis for that matter. Um, the problem being that there's a lot of factors that can interfere with getting a really good um, swab. So if you've got a biofilm, for example, you're not going to get um, that biofilm is kind of covering the wound bed underneath that you want to get the swab from, you won't get it. And a lot of times you don't know if you have a biofilm. So it doesn't work very well there. Um, clinician technique is another issue. So if you don't have a big enough space to get your swab from, if it hasn't been cleaned beforehand, um, if you haven't, you know, used enough pressure to get enough fluid onto your swab tip, that will interfere. Um, and, and I think I would guess that a lot of the hesitancy around nurses just going ahead and getting wound swabs has to do with our proficiency in gathering a swab and our initial assessment as to, is it truly infected or is it a stalled wound or, um, you know, is there something else happening? And you, you've got a big inflammatory process from something other than infection. Um, I don't know, what do you think? What have you seen in your practice? 
And I'll open that up to everybody. What do you ladies see? And gentlemen. Well, I, I think for me personally, like, I mean, as a student, I have never done that. I've just, you know, seen it happen kind of like time and time again over the last three years of my education. And, and it just kind of seems like um, it, it seems a little bit maybe physician dependent. So I've talked to some really experienced mm -hmm. nurses who say, oh, you know, I, I know this physician really well. And I know that if I don't take a, a wound swab and send them on their way, like in community, then sometimes it's like, well, why didn't you take a wound swab? Now it's really inconvenient to get the client back into the clinic. And um, so I, I think it's just kind of one of those, like, um, like anything in nursing, like it's not really black and white, it's kind of a gray area. And as a student, it's, you know, something that I'm, I'm not comfortable with, but in, in my experience, it's been a lot more um, nurses with more experience under their belt that have done it. Um, and I, I did want to ask you again, I know you mentioned biofilm earlier, but what are some like clinical kind of evidence that a wound might have biofilm in it? Biofilm can start to form within hours um, of, a, of, you know, debriding. Let's say you've cleaned up a wound really nicely and it's been debrided. It, you know, within 24 hours, that biofilm is trying to form again. If your wound is a chronic wound and it's been open for a really long time, you're pretty much guaranteed there's a biofilm there. The problem is we can't see it. So you look for other clinical um, signs, i.e. It's, it's a longstanding wound. It's not healing. Um, it's not, uh, you know, progressing. It, it's acting like an infected wound, but it's not infected. You don't have the, the pain and the erythema, um, the exudate. It's just kind of sitting there stalled. It's probably a biofilm. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right with your with your observation about um, unit specific and physician specific responses to getting a, a wound swab or a urinalysis for that matter. Um, I think once the docs get to know you uh, in, in your practice and I may be stepping out of line here, but I, I think once they know us well enough to trust our clinical judgment, so our assessment skills, to know that yes, um, if I think it's infected, it, it probably is that, that I have that um, background to make that call and to get the process started. Um, having said that, I've seen, talking about the community um, lens, I have heard uh, physicians in clinic three say, you know, well, I, I've got this wound swab from a client in community that's coming in tomorrow for an assessment and I've never met them. Why did they put my name on a rec? So for them, it's, it's, a, you know, I don't know who this person is. I understand you're trying to preempt the, the process, but I don't even know this patient. I have no idea why you're swabbing and they kind of react in that way if they don't know who the patient is. Thank you for weighing in on that very polarized question. I appreciate it. It's a tough one. Yeah. Deanna, well, autolytic. Oh, I was going to say Dr. Nuaduck had himself unmuted there as well. I'm not sure if he wanted to jump back into that oh, conversation. Please. Yes. I'm, I'm curious to hear a physician's view. Well, I uh, thank you, first of all, for, for an excellent uh, presentation tonight. Thank you. And uh, I uh, personally um, uh, like to hear what you had at what you said right at the very end where you know it, it's a it's a team um effort always and uh, uh, nursing staff having the uh, ability to reach out to physicians and physicians trusting those nurses to to do uh, these swabs is, is generally the way i like to approach it if if somebody believes that something's um uh, potentially infected and a swab might help in the management then uh, i usually have a a low threshold for for uh, uh, you know going forward and uh, encourage them to do that and and then we make our choices as you said we're always stick handling here yeah yeah exactly thank you for that thank you for um yeah it's nice to hear the other side of the other side of the coin thank you i remember somebody saying to me many years ago uh, you can never have too much information yeah you know, and, and granted, you, you describe a number of reasons why 
um, the process is fraught with difficulties. Mm -hmm. But again, it's information that you have, and mm -hmm. sometimes you act on it, and uh, um, it, the uh, the patient is better for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I want to make one comment on something else that uh, was mentioned earlier. You were you were talking about um, using um, uh, flagell. Yes. And, and more recently, um, I uh, had to use it and we were using the, the capsules and just getting the, the staff to break the mm -hmm. capsule and sprinkle mm -hmm. the granules mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. into the wound and it worked just as well as anything else. Yeah, yeah. If you can't get uh, um, the, the powder, I've seen that too, just breaking those little capsules open um, mm -hmm. and, and pouring them in. Yeah, they work very, very well. Could I ask a question? Would your um, would your decision about CNS swabs from nurses be changed if you had notification that the swab was done accompanied by a photo? Yeah, sure. Like I said, it's it's information, mm -hmm. and uh, the more you have, the better. Um, you know, the decision. Um, making process uh, moves. Um, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need to have that photo. Mm -hmm. um, it would help. But mm -hmm. if, if I was approached by, I work with Fong and if Fong called me and, and said, Dr. Nudek, uh, I'd, I'd like to take a swab of this wound. I'd say, sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good points. Good points, thanks. We so have wound swabs in our standing orders in the facility I work at. Mm. You can do a wound swab for CNS. It's on a standing order. Interesting. Are there any parameters? Um, just it's basically a nursing judgment. If you suspect infection, mm -hmm. if there's signs of infection and you have a rationale why you did the wound swab mm -hmm. and the docs are signing off on all those standing orders, mm -hmm. you know, so and we just go ahead and do it. The same with collecting urine specimens, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Where, um, where are you working? Where do I work at Berwick Royal Oak? Ah, private facility. It's not part of. Um, yeah. Well, it's not a funded. It's it's a private. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some kind of of standardized um, approach to managing infection and swabs? And mm -hmm. wouldn't that be great? Yes. So we're all doing the same thing same for the thing. same. Everyone's reasons. on the same page. Yeah. 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 I agree. Work in progress. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think everybody, every nurse should take the wound care course that's offered, the advanced wound care course that's offered through UBC or through uh, UVEC. Yeah. Do you know, um, I, I know the intranet uh, wound care LMS stuff is, is difficult to find and navigate, but there is really good information in the intranet if you can find it. Mm hmm uh, there is, there's really, really great learning there. And they have just updated the skin and wound site. So it is a little easier. In where, sorry? In the skin and wound platform on the intranet. Like through Island Health? Yeah. I don't have access. To, oh, it... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. not part of Island Health and private, so I don't have I'm access. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Oh. We also, as the LTCI, do post a lot of um, those uh, resources that are behind that internet firewall on our website so okay. definitely have a look um, yeah, on our I've, website I've saved that website so i will definitely yeah. through it yeah. so the other place you can go and i've i've done them too is uh i don't know if they're free or not but wounds canada yeah i love has, wounds canada yeah they have a wound care they have a wound care program that's there uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's lots of places to get your wound care education yeah, yeah. yeah. and i would step up on my soapbox here <laughs> and say that you know, we, we recognize the additional information and knowledge that you need for cardiac care, for uh, respiratory, for renal, and yet we don't tend to look at skin and wound as a, as a specialty per se, that I think should be. I, I agree entirely. Yeah. 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 It's the biggest organ of the body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Somebody had a question about um, biofilm. Thank you, Janelle. Yes, the provincial curriculum is on the learning hub. For those of us who are part of Island Health, yes. 
Uh, yes, I just see Nicola with her hand up, but the, the question about biofilm, if you wanted to try and answer that quickly first, was can an autolytic debridement gel be effective when biofilm is present? Probably not. Um, probably not. It, it's usually biofilm needs a mechanical debridement. It's really, really, really resistive um, to almost anything that you can throw at it. It's really tough. The, the matrix that um, forms the biofilm is really strong. It, it really goes above and beyond to protect itself from being dismantled. Um, it, it takes a lot of work to get them out. So, you know, if we can get them debrided and then make sure we keep our antimicrobials on so it doesn't regrow, um, that's the best way to go, to go there. Sorry, I've, I've got a quick little pop up there. Did that help? The other thing that does um, that does help is the Anisept Soak and Iodosorb. They will help to break down that biofilm so it's easier to get out of the way. Wonderful, and Dr. McPherson, you had a question. Hi. Huh, me weighing in again. Thank um, you. I would say I learned absolutely nothing about wound care in medical school. Hmm. Now that was in a previous millennium and things might be. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I think you'll have noticed that most of the physicians that came joined in today are either palliative or long-term care. I, I, I'm not sure if there were others because uh, I didn't catch everybody's uh, area of interest. So I, my approach with the malignant, never healing, fungating wound is I usually ask the local wound care experts, whoever they might be, what is the safest thing to put on this wound or the one that at least won't make it worse? And then I throw in the methadone, the flagell, uh, tranexamic acid, whatever the wound needs for symptom management and palliation, but the base product is whatever is gonna do the least damage to the wound. And I bow to the, the, the wound clinicians and the home care nurses and anybody who's taken any courses in this, because you're right, it's a whole field with very specialized knowledge. It, it is, and wounds are complicated and no two are the same. And um, yeah, it's a really huge area of study. It's, it's huge. Um, and I, I agree. I think the, the home care nurses and the clinic nurses that provide wound care on a, on a regular basis, they do a phenomenal job. They've, they've learned all kinds of, of um, tricks and tips to help with those difficult wounds. Um, they learn who their clients are and, and manage those, those other factors in their lives. They do, a, they do an amazing job. They're really, really good at what they do. Just cognizant, we're a little bit over time. What a great discussion. Thank you so much, Shelly, for Thank you. coming in at such last moment notice. We really, really appreciate And that was such a great conversation there at the end. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. And we will be posting, obviously, the video of this event on our website, as well as a PDF of um, the presentation. And I am sure Shelly would love to hear from you. If you have any additional questions, where we would be happy to um, connect you with Shelly after yes. today. If anybody has a local NSWOC that they can access, they're a great resource. Um, NSWOCs have tri-specialty with wounds, ostomy, and continence. So uh, they're a great go-to if you've got access to one. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm so pleased. Thank you, I Shelley. Part that was of great. Thing. Thank you for stepping Thanks, in. Shelley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good Thank night. You.